capital that could be expanded into bigger areas like Europe or North America or Central America or even the Amazon. And I just, I, you know, I've, I just learned that there's a, a, a new uh, adventure occurring here on Ceiba, which is the removal of goats, which are an invasive species. They're actually a problem on almost every island ecosystem worldwide. And I wanted to just give you an example of how quickly we can see this feedback and mechanism occur on islands. So this is an example uh, of uh, invasive species removal. The, in this case, it was rabbits on Choros Island, which is in Chile. Uh, and this was done by an organization called Island Conservation. And you can see right here on the left, this is before the removal of rabbits. And on the right, this is after the removal of rabbits, just two years later. You see this drastic change, this drastic feedback mechanism in real time that we can observe on islands that we just simply can't see in larger ecosystems. So islands really are a living laboratory allowing us to understand the effects that we have in our interventions on biodiversity loss. So when I say saving humanity one spider at a time, I don't mean it in, in, in silliness, although I think it is quite silly to, to, to expect that anyone can understand the implications of that uh, just in reading the sentence. But I hope that you, that you really believe that, that in fact, by just preventing the loss of one single species living on an island, we can maintain the stable state of island ecosystems for not only our future, but the future of our communities living on islands. But I wanted to share with you also a bit about my research. I've been working and studying um, in the Caribbean for, for my entire career, starting when I was a PhD student at the American Museum of Natural History. I think my first solo trip to do research on an island was in 2003, uh, and I've never turned back. I've been working and researching on islands, doing field work, doing terrestrial faunal surveys uh, in the last, over the last 15 years. And most of the time what I'm working on is, is arachnids. I study by and large the group that we call arachnids. Um, they're all, almost all terrestrial creatures um, with the exception of sea spiders and horseshoe crabs. Uh, but they include groups that you're familiar with like spiders and scorpions uh, and probably groups that you've never heard of like camel spiders or uh, tailless whip scorpions or uh, hooded tick spiders. All of these are unique groups of arachnids that have been living on earth as independent lineages for over 400 million years. So arachnids are a great model of how species survive and thrive in a variety of ecosystems on Earth. And for me, that's really fundamentally why I've chosen to pursue a career studying arachnids. It's not because as a child I fell in love with spiders, although I did. Um, <laughs> but it's really because I think that they, prov they provide a really great snapshot in time of what success looks like in an ecosystem. Uh, and they've really adapted to live on every ecosystem on Earth, in including right here in Seba. Um, and what I, I wanted to just point out is, is what, what sort of happens in a natural ecosystem. So ecosystems fluctuate through time. They experience change, that's natural. They experience disturbances like hurricanes, that's natural. And over time, the communities of plants and animals living in an ecosystem fluctuate. You see a constant pulsing of species accumulating through dispersal from other islands or speciation, the, the formation of new species through evolution and natural selection. But you also experience species loss. Species go extinct naturally. This is a process of nature. But when you push that process, that natural fl fluctuation beyond what the species, the, what the ecosystem memory is down here, then you suddenly get into this really, really dangerous situation where we have human-induced succession. That's where you see what appears to be a natural forest with species that approximate what an ecosystem would be, but the natural processes that protect humans, like prevention of disease, clean, the maintenance of clean water, um, clouds that produce their own rainfall, like right here on Seba, are gone. On the other side of the spectrum, what we see is a complete loss of natural function. So that's the des like complete desertification of an ecosystem, kind of like that island we saw in Choros, um, where the, the, the ecosystem just fully breaks down and is no longer functioning. And really, because we live during this period, and this is a fantastic quote written by Dr. Sarah Cruz sitting right there in the back, I think because we, we have been to many islands throughout the Caribbean and really experienced firsthand what it looks like when you start to move out of that natural ecosystem fluctuation, um, really because we as scientists are living during a time when human development is altering the natural environment at an extremely fast pace, we feel like we're in a race to discover 
collect and describe organisms before they go extinct. And this is not a race that we're winning. Uh, in fact, we are increasingly turning to new technologies like iNaturalist, like the power of citizen science, to fully understand what our ecosystems are. So if I don't know how many of you were at the Tuesday talk where they were talking about the importance of collect, collecting baseline information in seismic activity so that you do know when there's a, a, the, the next big eruption of the volcano coming. We need the same thing for biodiversity data. For most places, we don't have baseline information. We don't know how many species live there. We don't know whether their populations are healthy or unhealthy, how many individuals makes up a healthy population. And so conversely, we simply don't know when we start to slide out of that natural fluctuation and into something really precipitous where we might see global, uh, at least global on an island scale, catastrophic decline of species. And, you know, I said that I'm really focused on, on the Caribbean region, and I've been working on this region for 15 years, and, and the reason that I love it so much and why it's so in completely fascinating from a biological perspective is because the Caribbean is really geologically complex. It's made up of all of these independent geologic origins of islands that interact in, with each other in ways that don't exist anywhere else on the planet. So I think oftentimes when we hear about evolution on islands and, and these great stories like the, Charles, like the Darwin finches of the Galapagos or the Galapagos tortoises or maybe the Hawaiian honey creepers, another big bird group that's experienced natural selection on islands, those are all these simple systems. They're simple because they're isolated. The Caribbean is not only not isolated, but it's connected to two major faunistic regions, North America and South America. And at times it's thought that the Caribbean itself was a gateway through which plants and animals could, dis could disperse from one to the other. Uh, but when we talk about the Lesser Antilles, this volcanic arc over here on the side, there's actually some really clear ge geologic origins of the northern and the southern half, the timing of when they first erupted out of the ocean and started to form early islands. And so what that means is that we, there's all kinds of really interesting and weird dynamics that have occurred on this, this volcanic arc um, that, that, uh, that provide access to really different faunas. The fauna of the Greater Antilles up here, Cuba, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and the fauna of South America down here. Uh, two real diff really distinct routes of dispersal of plants and animals into the islands. And when we go out and work, we, do, we oftentimes spend a lot of our time not really trying to parse out these really interesting patterns, but rather trying to first create the baseline of information so that we can begin to understand these patterns and unravel them. Um, so for example, this is a paper that Sarah and I published two years ago uh, in 2019 that was the first ever survey inventory list of spiders and other arachnids for Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. Uh, and in this paper, which is not unusual for the Caribbean, about 30% of the species that we identified through that documentation process were entirely new to science. So when I say it's important that we establish baselines, what I mean is that we're, we're, we don't even know about 30% of the information that's out there. That's a pretty significant um, m missing gap uh, that won't allow us to really dive into what, what, what is normal, what is healthy in island populations and species. I work on scorpions primarily, uh, and this really beautiful scorpion here is a scorpion found here in Seba. There's two species in Seba. This is the first, uh, and this scorpion belongs to the scorpion family Buthidae, which is a, a family that produces neurotoxins that affect human nervous systems. Uh, and so they, they actually produce a toxin that tricks your brain into thinking that your hand is on fire when you're stung, when really all that's happened is you have a tiny puncture wound in your finger. Uh, and so they, their, their toxins have this distinct ability to interrupt the way that our nerves transmit signals to one another. I'll tell you, it, it feels about like a wasp sting, the one here. So it's certainly not lethal. It's certainly not like severely harmful to humans. To my knowledge, I've never heard of anybody having an allergic reaction, um, but not fun at all. Uh, they <laughs> typically live under bark and rocks and in like debris that you might have scattered around your property. Uh, this is the other species, and it's quite small, and, and I, have, I brought uh, both of these that I've collected over the last couple of days. Uh, they're alive still. Uh, they're back in my bag, so if you'd like to see what they look like in real life, they're probably much smaller than you're envisioning after seeing these giant pictures up on screen. Uh, but this is the second species. This is a species that uh, is currently considered a subspecies. Um, 
that's endemic to Seba. It's found nowhere else in the world, but it's 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 likely that it's a fully that it will be fully elevated to a species in in coming years. Uh, these are little tiny guys. They're really small, like the first knuckle of your thumb in length, uh, and they live under rocks. They're really really secretive. Uh, the only side of the island that I'm aware that that they've been found on uh, is is on the 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 northern facing slopes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the northern facing slopes. Uh, and, and, and they're tough to find. They live inside burrows that they construct themselves. They excavate the ground using those big, really powerful claws that they also use primarily for subduing their prey. Uh, so living a really different lifestyle than the other one. Uh, scorpions are cannibalistic, so if they do encounter members of either the same species or other species, they'll readily eat each other. Not, not, not the friendliest of neighbors to have. This species, I don't know if you can even see it on the screen, I loved this picture uh, from my naturalist because it really, I think, demonstrates the effective camouflage. This is a species of spider that Sarah Cruz is an expert on, and in fact, this species right here uh, was described by her maybe a decade or so ago. Um, before that, it was not known uh, to be a distinct species living here on Seba. It's found Seba, St. Martin, and St. Bart's, I think. I got that right. You can ask her at the end of the talk. Uh, and what's really interesting about these spiders is that they're exceptionally well camouflaged, but they're also exceptionally fast, and they don't live in webs like what we oftentimes think of as, as sp that spiders do. Uh, many species of spiders do not live in webs, and rather errant, so they just walk around uh, their environment and sit are sit and wait predators re with a really excellent camouflage, just sitting around and waiting for prey to walk by. And I brought a couple of videos that Sarah made. This first one is a video that she made in her in her in her room here in Queen's Garden just a few days ago. Uh, and I really like this video because it's eating a mosquito. Um, and so if you're wondering why we want these spiders around, well, the answer is they're probably doing a pretty good number on your mosquito population here in Seba. Uh, and let's see if I can get it to play. So you probably missed that because these, spider these spiders move so fast that it's almost impossible to see their actual strike uh, with human eyes. Uh, and, and I have another video, this is not of the species here on Seba, but this is a species that uh, Sarah captured using high-speed video uh, cameras that, that slow down the rate of replay. Um, they're about 2,000 frames per second. Uh, and so you can see the spider is sitting here and waiting. Sarah's introduced a prey item. This is a, a cricket right here up top uh, near the, the, the back leg. Its face is facing pointed down towards the bottom of the screen. Um, and when I click play, you'll be able to see the movement of the spider executed over a few frames. And you, you may have noticed that when you first, when the video first started, the spider was sitting there with its legs all spread out, sort of evenly around its body. Uh, and that's because spiders like this one have ears in their feet. Uh, they have acoustic organs that allow them to pick up vibratory signals. And so by having the, the legs evenly spread around the body, they're able to hear in all directions, omnidirectional hearing, and sense the direction from which the cricket is approaching, so the leg that's closest to the origin of the vibrations. Uh, and then they pivot to capture that, that cricket. Uh, and it happens in just less than a blink of an eye. I think this happens in like 10 frames or something, which is probably um, like a millisecond. Uh, it's really, really incredibly quick. If you watch it in, in real life, you, do, you, you see the spider and then suddenly the spider's eating. You don't even know what happened. Pretty incredible. She's the first one that ever documented this movement. Uh, and in fact, she's working with, with um, a physicist. She's collaborating with a physicist now to understand how the physics of these spiders actually function. Uh, because the way that they move defies how our understanding of, of musculature in some ways. Um, it's just way too fast. It's the fastest turning strike of any living animal. So other things that Sarah and I work on is we try to really understand by looking across many different species of spiders and insects what the origins of life in the Caribbean are. Uh, and this might not sound particularly important, but, but I think what the, the underlying importance of it is that the way that things disperse onto islands and change and adapt to island life is important for the longevity of species on islands. So if we don't understand the past evolutionary trajectories of animals and plants, how are we ever going to anticipate the future evolutionary needs? Species can respond to climate change. They have for millennia, and they'll continue to do so. But we have to be able to anticipate the evolutionary needs of plants and animals. So we spend a lot of time uncovering the past so that we can predict the future. 
And one of the things that we've discovered uh, in a paper published just a couple of years ago that looked at 20 different lineages, I don't know, I'm sure Sarah will tell me I'm wrong, but 20 different lineages of insects and, and arachnids that occur across the Caribbean islands, is that there's two main sources of, uh, of fauna, of, of um, the, the, the ancestors of species living in the Lesser Antilles. In the northern half of the Lesser Antilles, the ancestors come from the Greater Antilles. They've moved down as the lesser northern half of the Lesser Antilles of volcanic chain formed. They moved out of the Greater Antilles and slowly island hopped their way down. But they met in the middle because the, coming from the south at the same time, actually slightly earlier, was another set of species. And this set of species came from South American ancestors and island hopped their way up the chain. Uh, and, and we see that split, it differs in different species. So in some species we see it between uh, one pair of islands and in other species we see it between another pair. But in general, it, it occurs right, right, right around Guadalupe, either above Guadalupe or south of Guadalupe. Um, and so, so up here in Ceiba, we can thank the rest of the Greater Antilles for our plants and animals. Uh, and if we, were, if we were down in Dominica right now, we would be thanking the South American fauna for the ancestors of the Dominica plants and animals. Um, and I just wanted to, to end my part because I want to hand it off to, to Reina uh, and make sure she has time to tell you all about the frogs and other reptile. Well, they're not rep other reptiles, frogs and reptiles of the Caribbean. But I wanted to just end with a few photos that, of, of arachnids that you might encounter while you're here on Seba. So I encourage you to go out, go for a hike, walk around your garden, walk around the grounds of, of the hotel or bed and breakfast that you're staying at and see if you can spot some of these things. The first one is a, a silver a garden spider. Um, these are pretty common. They're active during the day, so you don't need to be out at night to find them. And they're, what, what's really characteristic about them is they sit with their legs in an X pattern, uh, and sometimes you'll see a little squiggly X in the center of their web that's probably used to distract predators so that they aren't quite sure where the spider in, begins and ends. Uh, pretty big spiders, bold. You, they're, they're often recognized easily. This is another one that's pretty big and bold, and you might, might see that they actually put their web up every evening and take their web down every night. So every single night they make a brand new web. They, they eat the old silk uh, as a way of recycling the amino acids that are used to make that silk. Um, and so during the day you might spot them just in the corner of a leaf. They like to hide out in the corner of a rolled up leaf during the day. They're pretty big spiders. They're, they're about the size of a US quarter. Um, and they're really this beautiful golden color. This is the Antillean orb weaver. This one is another one that I think is probably shocking if you've ever seen it out at night. This is another errant spider, so they don't build webs. Um, they just sort of wander around on the ground. Uh, but this is a huntsman, really beautiful. These beautiful fuzzy spiders. Um, definitely, if you see them around your house, don't shoo them away because they're taking care of your cockroach population. And this last one is, is, is another one that, that I think oftentimes you, you would see during the day. They, they, they live in webs that are always horizontal to the ground, uh, which is contrary to many kinds of spiders that build vertical facing webs. Um, and then their horizontal webs are always missing a quarter of the web. This is a really distinct um, uh, style of the, this group of spiders. They build a three quarter uh, of the way around web. Uh, and what's really easy to spot about uh, about them is that if you look at the underneath of their body, you might often see these like really two bright, bright red, uh, sort of almost reflective orange dots on their belly. Uh, and it really stands out in a way that, that I think often gets my attention anyways. And the last one is my favorite. Uh, this is actually not a true spider, but it's the closest living relative of true spiders called a, a whip spider. Um, and they lack venom and can't produce silk. So unlike spiders, they, they have neither of those things. And, in, and their first pair of legs, instead of being a leg used for walking, is a leg that's used for sensory. So it's like a giant antenna. And it's completely covered in sensory pits that allow it to smell, taste, and feel vibrations. Um, really, really beautiful animals. They care for their young for long periods of time and are also most definitely taking care of your cockroach and cricket populations around your house. And they can get pretty big, yeah. Here in Seba, the, with the legs spread out, they, they can get this size, so pretty big. In other parts of the world, they're really like quite dinner plate size. Um, so they look fearsome, but are actually like, I would say the sweetest of all arachnids. <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Raina to tell you about some other sweet animals.
right. Thank you, Lauren. So I, I have seen this animal on your island, and I get kind of freaked out when I see them at first. But then, so if you have that reaction, I think it's normal for non-arachnologists. But then I remember what Lauren told me, and then I center myself, and I can appreciate the beauty. So if you come out with us for the hike tomorrow night, there's a good chance that we'll see one of these. Oh, sorry. And I did want to make a public service announcement about the featured cocktail tonight, the green frog. So you do not have any green frogs on this island. If you see a green frog, please alert your local wildlife authority as soon as possible. <laughs> because there's a good chance that it is an introduced species that is not supposed to be here. So unless it's a cocktail, in which case you're fine. Um, so... Yeah, so I, unlike Lauren and Sarah, I have only been working in the Caribbean for the last couple years, and this is my very first time visiting Seba, and it, I've had a wonderful time so far, so thank you everyone for making this possible. Um, and so most of my work has been focused in Central Africa, in the Gulf of Guinea Islands, which is an archipelago off the western coast of Central Africa, um, but I more recently have started working in the Lesser Antilles, and also in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, and for all the reasons that Lauren was describing about the, the geology of the islands and also their proximity to these different sources of continental species that would have dispersed to the islands, I'm finding it to be just this really fascinating and stimulating environment to be working in. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to continuing my work. Um, so I am a herpetologist and herpetologists are folks that study amphibians and reptiles. And I work at the California Academy of Sciences, which is a natural history museum. So we like to call ourselves sort of a, a lending library of life. So instead of lending out books, we have a reference collection of plants and animals and fungi. Actually, I don't know if we have fungi at the Academy. I think we're just plants and animals um, that we, we loan out to researchers. And we also have researchers come and visit us um, to study this diversity of life. And so these are my colleagues in the herpetology department. I think we may be one of the only herpetology departments in the world that is composed entirely of women. Um, so <laughs> it, it tends to be a very man-dominated field. <laughs> so this is our, our band photo when I started at the academy. Uh, and so these are my colleagues, Lauren and Erica, and we're standing here in one of the main collection rooms of, of the academy. Um, and so we, we have one of the world's largest and most important collections of amphibians and reptiles. Um, although we don't have a very strong collection for the Caribbean, but that's something that we're working on. Uh, and so much of the research that I have done and that our research group does, like I was saying, is mostly focused on African species. Um, but some of the general themes of the research that we do, we study the evolutionary relationships of species. Um, and so we use a combination of genetic data and features of the, the organisms themselves to understand how different species are related to each other to build the tree of life of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, I'm also very interested in island biogeography, and that's just sort of as Lauren was describing, so the colonization or dispersal history of species through archipelagos and major source areas on continents that are um, leading to species arriving in archipelagos and then diversifying within them. And then I'm also very focused on the conservation genetics of species and in particular focus on island species. Again, for all the reasons that Lauren was describing, we know that island species are in trouble. And in particular, we know that often amphibian and reptile species are in serious trouble. And it's not because necessarily other types of animals are not in trouble. It's just that we know a little bit more often about the amphibians and reptiles, so we know already that they're either threatened or already um, of conservation concern, whereas for the organisms that Lauren and Sarah study, as she was describing again, sometimes we don't even know that there's a unique species on the island. And so they tend to be sort of one step behind of just trying to document the species diversity that's there before they can then move on to that next step of are these species in trouble. Um, and then in addition to those main research areas, I also have some projects looking at amphibian disease. So as many of you may have heard, there's uh, two species of fungi that infect amphibian skin and that are causing global declines of amphibians. Um, and so this is a research area that has 
even though not it's not necessarily been the initial focus of many amphibian biologists, it's become very central to our work because if your study organisms are dying off catastrophically, it's pretty hard to not ignore um, the pressing nature of this issue and to want to do something about it. And then I also have some other research areas that are more tied to just sort of the amazing natural history of the organisms that I study. And um, so a lot of the, the tree frog species that I study in, in Africa are really colorful and there are species where males and females differ in color and we have no idea why. And um, so I have a lot of research questions just with this observation that I've been making in the field about all the color variation uh, within species, between males and females of species, and then between species. And then of course, if you're interested in coloration, um, and in particular, if you think that it's related to the behavior of the species that you're studying, then you need to know what the species themselves see. So we tend to apply our human bias of how we experience the world and think that that's how other organisms are experiencing things, but organisms differ in how heavily they rely on their different types of senses. So some species are more visual, some are more uh, auditory, some are using sensory, like vibrations. Um, and then even within those senses, different types of organisms are attuned to different um, types of signals within them. So for instance, those of you who are maybe getting a little older have maybe noticed that you can't hear the highest frequencies necessarily of things. So like those fridge alarms, maybe you don't hear it when your fridge door is still open. Um, and so that's just because different uh, types of organisms and even organisms as they age, their, their acoustic sensitivity changes. And so certain types of animals can hear really high pitch frequencies. Some of them are attuned to lower pitch frequencies. Um, and then similarly within the visual system, some animals focus on different wavelengths of light that are at different parts of the light spectrum. Um, and then also within that parts of the either ultraviolet light or infrared light spectrum. And so there are some species that have these, what we call hidden or secret communication channels because they're signaling in the ultraviolet, which is not visible to us. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is secret to those animals or to um, other animals in the same environment as them. So many birds, for instance, can see in the ultraviolet and they'll have uh, different color patches that to us, maybe the bird looks drab, but to other individuals of their species, it actually has a very vibrant coloration. So these are just some of the general sorts of things that I'm interested in, in case um, you'd like to chat about any of them tonight, I'll be here. <laughs> um, but then with respect to the Lesser Antilles and to Seba Island in particular, I'm just gonna share some of the research projects that myself and my colleague Michael in the back are, have been focusing on for the last couple years. Um, and then in particular, what we're hoping to get out of our time here on Seba. So Seba is indicated here in this map of the Lesser Antilles. And you have one species of frog here. It is literally here <laughs> all around us. Um, and this is a species that is found throughout the Lesser Antilles. And it's um, a very, very widespread species, and then it's also very locally abundant. And um, so if you haven't seen one of these yet on your, on your time here, or if you're a resident here, I'd be a little bit surprised because I've seen them in many different habitats. Um, but again, we're very likely to see one of these on Friday. Um, so you can join us then. Another species that is very, very widespread in the Lesser Antilles that also occurs here on Seba is the house gecko. Again, this is a species that even if you haven't ventured out much uh, into the forest here that you might have seen, they often can be found gathering around sources of light in town, and that's because they're hanging out there to eat bugs. Um, this is a species that is 100% with certainty introduced here to Seba. So this map here is showing its distribution around the world, and it's one of the most successful invasive species, especially in more tropical environments and um, so it you can find it those places where there aren't black dots is probably just because people haven't made an iNaturalist <laughs> observation from there yet but there's a good chance that it's there especially in the tropical band and um, but it's a very common species to find on tropical islands and that's because they're excellent stowaways and um, so unfortunately they're very very successful at invading and also very successful at establishing a viable population once they get to a new place and they don't need much, they just need 
like a wall that they can hang out on and a light <laughs> to attract the bugs and they're perfectly happy. Um, so now getting to a more unique species. So this is the Seba least gecko. Um, and this, I like to show photos of the animals in the hand if I can, just because it gives you a sense of scale. Um, so this is a photo that we took just a couple days ago here on Seba. And these little gecko lits are endemic to just a couple of islands here in the Lesser Antilles. So you can find them on Seba, and then also the islands in the St. Kitts Bank. So that includes Stacia, St. Kitts, and Nevis. Then we have this, this big fella. This is the, the turnip-tailed gecko. Um, and so this is a species that you can find in Central and South America. And then also on almost all, maybe all of the islands in the Lesser Antilles, they're a bit more secretive. Um, so they tend to be in um, underneath bark on tree trunks or in sort of a cavity in a tree. You might get them in your home occasionally. Um, but they're certainly not as common or easy to spot as that Mediterranean house gecko would be. And we actually haven't seen one yet on Seba on our stay here. Um, so if you see one, sorry, we saw one, we haven't caught one. Um, if you see one, please let us know <laughs> because we're very eager to catch one. Um, and it'll make sense in a minute why. But they're, they're very, very large and they might be a little bit intimidating if you were going to try to grab it yourself. You're welcome to try, but I can't guarantee that it won't bite you. Um, so yeah, so they're a species that has a very wide distribution. And then this is the Sabin anole, which this is another species that I'd be surprised if you haven't seen yet. They're very, very abundant here. Um, but don't let that abundance take you for granted because they're actually 100% endemic to Seba. So you can't find them anywhere else in the world. They're only found here. And um, Mike, again, is uh, an anole biologist. He specializes in them. And I have also done quite a bit of work on, on anoles. And I think they're one of the most spectacular species. So it's not common to see this really cool polka dot pattern on an anole lizard. But all the islands more or less have one or two species of anole. Um, and, and the Sabo one is a really special one. Um, and then you also have on Seba a unique subspecies of the common iguana. So um, we took this photo just heading down towards the dock the other day to get gas. <laughs> um, and so the, uh, the iguanas here are really dark in coloration, and that's why they've been given this special subspecies designation. But in terms of how they're related to the common green iguana and these other populations of green iguana throughout the Lesser Antilles and Central and South America, it's not entirely clear. Um, they certainly are considered to be introduced and even invasive on some of the islands in the Lesser Antilles. Um, and so there are folks who are studying those questions about which islands is it supposed to be on, which islands is it a nuisance uh, on, just with respect to another species of iguana that is native to those islands. Um, so yes, but on on Seba, if you want to see them, I think that's a good place to go check them out. They're pretty unique looking green iguana. And then we also have on Seba um, a unique species of snake, the Seba racer. And this is a, a, a montage of Sarah catching a snake the other night. So Sarah is a, an arachnid specialist, but she's also not afraid of snakes, which is rare because usually I find that people either have a tolerance of one group or the other, but not both. <laughs> um, and so this is a, a unique species of snake that you can find here in Seba and also on Stacia. It used to be on St. Kitts and Nevis, but it appears to have been extirpated there. Um, so it's a near single island endemic uh, is just here and, and Stacia is, are the only two populations that seem to be still doing okay. Um, and this is also a species that we found at the site where we're planning to do the night hike tomorrow. Um, but we, we brought this individual in to sh um, do some work with, with some of the students here. And um, so, yeah, so it's, it, many of the students said that they had seen snakes before in their backyards, but also on hikes. So even if you don't come on the hike with us tomorrow, if you pay attention, especially around rock piles, there's a good chance that you might see one on your own. 
All right, um, so now I'm just going to share a couple of the ongoing research questions that, that we have, and in particular with a focus on what we're hoping to accomplish while we're here on SABA. Um, so this is some work that's being led by Michael looking at the, the um, Koki frogs, so the Eleutherodactylus johnstoni, which is the frog that is singing all around us, and patterns of genetic diversity throughout the Lesser Antilles and a couple other uh, regions where the species occurs. And really the main motivation of this work is to understand the native range of the species and the places where it appears that it has been introduced. So there are several islands in the Lesser Antilles where there are records of folks bringing the frogs with them because they love the song maybe, um, and, and they wanted to have that familiar song when they were going to sleep perhaps. Uh, and so there are a number of islands where there are documented records of when the species were introduced and uh, where, but that's not the case for all of the islands. And as you can see, um, there are very locally abundant species. They tend to establish when they're introduced. And so it's very challenging to tell just based on looking at the frogs, whether or not they're native or introduced, whether or not they're supposed to be on an island or whether perhaps they um, are not supposed to be there. And so we can use genetic tools to help us sort out which of those is the case. And so that's what we've done here with the help of collaborators who have sampled other islands as well throughout the, the Lesser Antilles. And so here you can see each of the islands that has um, a little dot on it is an island that we have sampled. And the uh, colors of the dots represent sort of the genetic cluster that those frogs fell into. And so the first major two genetic clusters that we found, which was kind of a surprise to us, is that all those islands in the southern Lesser Antilles that have a black dot fell into one genetic cluster that was very distinct from the other islands. Uh, and then within the northern Lesser Antilles, we have a couple of different genetic clusters but as you can see, the northernmost islands all have the purple genetic cluster, and then Montserrat has several genetic clusters. And so when we see this general pattern, what it tells us is that Montserrat has a lot of genetic diversity and that these other islands do not. And so typically what that pattern means is that the place with the most genetic diversity is the, the native or original range of the species and then just a few individuals from that native range would have been introduced to other areas. And that's why those areas have uh, just a subset of the original genetic diversity and also why they are all the same. Um, and so when we look at this pattern, what we think it means is that Montserrat has native Eleutherodactylus johnstoni and that these other islands in the northern part of the Lesser Antilles all have introduced populations. And then all of these islands that have the black dot, um, when we looked at the genetic diversity within them, they had very low genetic diversity and it was shared among all the islands. And so in this case, we don't know for sure which of these islands would have been considered the source population. And there are a couple islands that we haven't sampled yet. So um, that's on the to-do list, but we would expect to see a pattern similar to the Montserrat pattern, but on one of these other islands that would sort of indicate this is the native range of that black genetic cluster, um, and then it, that would have been the introduction or the source of introduction for these other islands. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so we'll stay tuned um, to see what those results show us. And, and also that the this is a species that has successfully been introduced back into mainland South America. Um, and so if you've been looking closely at this map, perhaps you've noticed that there isn't a colored dot for the island of Saba, and that's because no one had sampled the frogs here for a genetic sample that was available to us to include in, in this data set. Um, and so, as you might imagine, we haven't had trouble getting genetic samples of this species since we've arrived. Um, and so now we just need a little bit of time in the genetics laboratory. We'll be sequencing those samples and so hopefully we'll have an answer soon as to what the status is of these frogs here on SABA. So um, another uh, reason that we wanted to come to SABA was to 
see what the genetic diversity is of the Sabin least gecko. So again, this is a species that we can also find in the other islands nearby, so St. Eustatia, St. Kitts, and Nevis. And Michael already had samples from these other islands, and we've looked at the genetic diversity and genetic relationships between these islands, um, but we didn't have samples from Saba. And so we're very interested to see, as you can see here, there's a little bit of um, genetic structuring or genetic differentiation among the individuals on these different islands. And that's sort of what we expect because these are very small geckos. They're probably not dispersing between islands very much on their own. Um, and so as they're isolated through time, they start to accumulate genetic differences. And those differences don't necessarily mean that each of these islands has a unique species. Um, but it's still important for sort of the long-term understanding of genetic diversity and evolutionary history of these populations to understand just how unique they are from one another. So for instance, if a population were to become extirpated or driven extinct on one of the islands and we wanted to do a reintroduction, um, which is something that is happening, for instance, with Galapagos tortoises, then we would want to know what is the best proxy population where we would want to source individuals for reintroduction. And so having an understanding of relationships of these different populations within a species can help us do that if it gets to that um, sort of like worst case scenario. Um, and then for this giant gecko, gecko species, um, so this is a species that Currently, uh, based on the way that the, the species is described, it has a very big distribution. So it's found throughout much of South America, into Central America, and also several islands throughout the Lesser Antilles. And this is another species where Michael has quite a bit of preliminary data, um, but where we, we didn't have data from Saba yet. And what I think is particularly exciting about the data that he has so far um, and here we're just looking at the evolutionary relationships of these different populations, is that we have mainland samples as sort of the outgroup or the most ancestral evolutionary lineage. And then we have several groups of Lesser Antillean islands, um, sort of suggesting that there was a dispersal from the mainland and then sort of moving up the chain of the Lesser Antilles. But then we have a second mainland group that is nested within these island groups. And so we tend to think of islands as being sort of an evolutionary dead end where things get there and then they evolve to be unique. Sometimes they evolve to be very strange. They evolve to be very giant. They evolve to be really tiny. They evolve to be really tame because they don't have their natural predators around. And then we tend to think, well, if they were to make it back to the mainland, there's no way they would be successful, right? Because they've sort of evolved to live in this very unique context. Um, but that's not always the case. And so islands can also be an important source population of species that then recolonize the continent and are very successful when they return to the continent. And so we see that in these geckos, or at least we think that's what we're seeing in the genetic data that we have so far, where they have sort of moved through the Lesser Antilles archipelago and then made their way back to the mainland. Um, and so we have a, a very interesting evolutionary history of this group. And we'll be excited to see, hopefully, if we can catch one of these here on Saba, um, how Saba fits into that picture. And then the last project that I wanted to share with you tonight um, is looking at variation in the phenotype, which is sort of the physical representation of an animal, as opposed to the genotype, which is the genome of the animal. Um, and so, of course, probably obvious to you that there's a lot of variation within species and how different individuals look. If we look around the room here tonight or the, the amphitheater here tonight, there's a lot of variation in how we all look. Um, and the same is true for all species, right? They're not a monolith. There's variation in, in how individuals within a species look. And that sort of variation can also be really important to consider when we're thinking about the long-term conservation and evolutionary potential of species. And so we want to make sure that we are maintaining genetic diversity and phenotypic diversity to give populations their best shot at handling whatever global change is going to bring to them and being able to adapt and to continue to survive, in this case, on Saba Island. Uh, and so the local anoles here on Saba 
and also on several other islands throughout the Lesser Antilles have a, a really interesting pattern in their coloration in terms of um, how they look in the hot or dry environments on the island compared to the cooler wet habitats in the environment or on the island. Um, and this is variation that we can see within a single species. And I said on Seba, but actually we don't know that yet because that's one of the reasons that we're here. Um, but it's a pattern that has been documented on other islands in the Lesser Antilles. So this is um, an example of another species not here on Seba that Michael has been working on for a while. And so you can see that the individuals that are in the hot, dry habitats have a more light or sort of blanched coloration compared to the ones that we find in the closed canopy forest, which tend to have a richer, dark, more green coloration. Um, and we don't know exactly why this is happening, but it's a pattern that we're seeing in many different species on several islands in the Lesser Antilles, because almost all the islands have some sort of a rain shadow effect where they have a drier part of the island and a wetter part of the island. And it tends to be more pronounced on islands that have uh, enough elevation to really drive that rain shadow. So one of the potential explanations for why these lizards would have these differences in coloration is that they're matching the habitat that they're in to better camouflage and to avoid predators. And so this probably seems a little bit silly. We feel like it's a little bit silly, but this is a legitimate way that scientists try to get at this question. Um, and so on the left, there is a gif of making an army of clay, uh, clay lizards. <laughs> um, and then what we do with these is we, we deploy them in the field. Um, and then we set up camera traps, which are motion censored on a subset of them. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're trying to see who attacks these lizards and then also whether the different colors of lizard get attacked more or less and we've set these up in the dry parts of the island and in the wetter parts of the island and so the hypothesis would be that the greener ones are um, attacked less in the rainforest and that the brown ones are attacked less in the dry forest and here we were just checking one of our sites this afternoon and these arrows are pointing at these little sorry at these little uh, marks here on the head which something made them. Unfortunately, this is a model that we didn't have a camera trap pointing at, of course, um, but it looks to me like some sort of a beak mark. Uh, and so we, we didn't get a chance to check all of our cameras yet. We do have some actually just right here on the trail behind the Eco Lodge. Um, and then we also have more of them set up on the trail where we're gonna be going tomorrow. So um, this, this is what one of the camera trap photos shows. And as you can see here, the camera was triggered by uh, some non-native wildlife that were exploring the vicinity, but they did not attack our lizard model. So I guess that's a good thing. But yeah, if you're interested in, in seeing this, again, where we're going tomorrow night, we'll have some of these out. Um, we won't be able to check the camera trap photos right away, but you'll be able to see the models. And so with that, um, again, we'd like to thank Seba See and Learn, Queen's Gardens for putting us up, and the Seba Conservation Foundation, and then all of our collaborators that we've had working here in Seba, and then also the other islands that we've worked on in the Lesser Antilles. And we'd be happy to take any of your questions. question was, are there any plans to reintroduce the racer to St. Kitts? And as far as I know, there are not. Um, but, okay, and Kai says no. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's an example of a species that kind of gets at what Lauren was describing with these really delicate leakages in the ecosystem and these different aspects of the food web. And so losing an important predator species like a snake um, can have really devastating consequences on sort of the balance of the other main players in the ecosystem. So 
maybe that's something that we can convince them to consider. But it would also mean that we need to understand um, a bit more about the ecology of that species and then also to make sure that we actually have a sufficient stable population here in Seba and also in Stacia before we would consider removing individuals to do a reintroduction. So yeah, reintroductions are quite a bit complicated um, for, for several reasons, but for top predators or ecosystem engineer species like Galapagos tortoises, it is an area that several different conservation groups and, and local government agencies are moving towards. So the question was, what what on an island like Seba has a bigger impact? Local, local things like invasive species or global things like increasing severity of, of storms? And I think, you know, really the, the answer is that those things go hand in hand. And, and it, it's not an additive problem where one and one makes two. It's, it's actually a multiplicative problem where one and one makes three. Uh, so as you have invasive species that are degrading the natural environment, you inhibit the ability of the natural environment to respond to what would perhaps be natural things like storms, even incre storms in increasing severity. So as we sort of like slowly chip away at the stability of ecosystem li linkages, we're also chipping away at the ability of the ecosystem to bounce back when it experiences a perturbation, when it experiences something like a severe storm. Uh, and so the answer is difficult because yeah, like invasive species are incredibly problematic as is development, as is like the desire for everybody on earth to have like good electricity and good internet and good water. And, but the, but the problem is that when you add those things with the increasing severity of storms, what you ultimately do is impact the ability of these ecosystems to bounce back. Uh, and, and that's what really needs, to, what the focus really needs to be on is the ability, preserving that ability for ecosystems to bounce back. And you can do that by removing invasive species. That's gonna be a huge help. You can do that by setting aside national park land. That's gonna be a huge help. And you can do that by convincing the local community that their biodiversity is more important to live because it maintains the ability for their local ecosystems to protect them from global storm from things like increased severity of storms. And all of those things together are the solution. It's not that any one uh, is, is, is better than another, although you can do things, like what you have the power to change is local stuff. You don't have the power to change necessarily the increasing severity of storms. Although you can vote with your consumer dollars, right? You can, you can vote against the increasing pollution and development of the world. Uh, but but really, it's it's what you can do locally, and and what you can do as a community locally. That's going to start to shift the balance away from the inability to deal with change, and towards the ability to really take what's coming at you. There's a question back there, and then one up here. The question was in the sort of la last resort effort of reintroducing species or proxy species when the local species has been extirpated is the focus on trying to match the genetic diversity that was lost or trying to introduce um, a lot of genetic diversity to sort of increase the resilience of that introduced population and I think it's a really new area of science, and so we don't actually really know what the best uh, approach is. And I think it also really depends on what is even feasible, like what, what even your options are for a reintroduction population. 
Um, and so, and then there's also still a lot of work to be done in understanding how that genetic diversity translates into the phenotypic diversity or sort of what the animal looks like, what the animal's physiology is, um, and sort of its ability to adapt to its local environment. So I, I think that really an approach that is sort of hedging our bets, there is sort of this understanding that more genetic diversity is usually better because when you have diversity in a population, you have the ability to adapt to new selective pressures in the environment. Um, and so I think in most cases, that will be the approach that folks are taking. There's also approaches where certain resistance genes for particular diseases or other stressors in the environment have been identified in some species. And so I think if there's the ability to say, for instance, we know that this frog is resistant or this particular genotype of frog is resistant to that fungus pathogen in the environment, we should introduce individuals that have that genetic background because we know that they'll be able to survive even though we know that this environment has this really devastating fungal pathogen in it. Then if all of that information is available to make the decision, I think that that will factor in. But in most cases, I think where the field is now is just more diversity is better and then try to find the most closely related proxy species or proxy population to be the source of the introduction. But, you know, I think I would add that, like, uh, th that famous saying of a pinch of prevention is worth a pound <laughs> of cure, it, it couldn't be more true than in the case of trying to reintroduce extirpated or extinct species. The amount of monetary investment that's required to not only identify what the best thing is to reintroduce, but also to create a captive breeding program, to monitor the reintroduction program, to monitor the individ individuals that you've reproduced and their fecundity, how many, in how many offspring they're having and whether their population is becoming stable. Like this is really, really expensive stuff. And the amount of money that's invested in those kinds of outcomes are sometimes the last resort, you know? It's the, it's the only way that we think that we can s save this ecosystem from falling into catastrophic imbalance, but, on the, but conversely, investing that money into the prevention goes so much further. Because not only are you investing in the pre prevention of the extinction of a single species, you're investing in the prevention of everything that lives in the ecosystem of that species. And so, so really, when we talk about reintroductions, what we're talking about is like absolute rest, last resort. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the geology itself, oh sorry, the question is um, uh, in the map that I showed of the, the colored map of the Caribbean and the geologic history of the Caribbean, um, Jamaica was a different color and, and, and why is that? And, and the answer is that it is geologically distinct. Um, Jamaica sits on the, on the Caribbean plate uh, and is oftentimes considered part of the Greater Antilles because it's a large island that's proximal to the other Greater Antillean islands. Um, but the origin of it is thought to be uh, part of Central America, probably a block of Central America that broke off and slowly drifted um, eastward. Uh, and, and it's thought to have been so almost completely submerged at various times uh, in history. Probably the only part of Jamaica that was entirely above water continuously was, were the Blue Mountains. Um, and so it has not only a distinct fauna, but also a distinct arrival time for many of the species that live there. So they, they didn't disperse into the Caribbean at the same time that things dispersed into Cuba or the island of Hispaniola, which is Haiti in the Dominican Republic. It is, they just have a completely unique dispersal in, into Jamaica, which creates, has created a unique fauna. So the question is, if, if you were to see a spider uh, and you wanted to 
contribute your observation to the scientific record on iNaturalist, are there specific things that you should be looking for to document? And the answer is, you know, the best, highest resolution photos that you can take of the whole body, both from underneath and on top. And if you can get photos of the web, if it's sitting in a web, that's going to be your best bet in terms of con contributing that observation uh, and, and allowing whoever in the community, because it's not only scientists, it's also citizen scientists that review those observations and help to form the identification. Uh, all, all available information is going to help. Um, you can also take a close-up shot of the eyes. Eyes are really distinctive uh, in arachnids. Uh, it helps you understand what family that, ar that arachnid might belong to. Um, and, and so all of those things I think, think would help. But, but whole body, just high quality shots that aren't blurry or dark, which is really hard. Uh, I have a horrible time taking, taking photos um, off, like with my phone. I'm like probably the worst example of a citizen scientist photographer. Um, but I think, yeah, in terms of reviewing those, I think whenever I see a whole body shot that's clear and in focus, it's the best thing I can hope for. Thank you so much. All righty, guys. Let's give a huge round of applause to our awesome speakers tonight. All right. Now, also, thank you to everybody that came out today, both in person and online. We really appreciate you guys coming out and making See and Learn exactly what it is. And if you guys have been enjoying your drinks and the venue as the highest bar ele in elevation in the Dutch Caribbean, let's give a big round of applause to Eco Lodge out here. They have been great for us the past few days, so uh, really appreciative of that. Now, there is dinner tonight. It is Taco Thursday, so make sure, even if you haven't signed up, there is still room for you guys to stick around. But we do need to turn this venue back into a restaurant. So we are going to ask that you guys clear this area for just about 10 minutes, maybe get a head start and look for some critters in the woods um, or something like that, and uh, or see any of the uh, creatures that they brought with them. Also a great resource. And uh, other than that, Thank you guys so much for coming.